Hi everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Raúl, and I'm sorry for the to all of those from Argentina. I'm also from Argentina. Soy de Córdoba, so I'm drinking Ferne. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this talk needs to be in English for the online streaming and everyone else who only speaks English. So welcome everyone. We want to thank Polka.Have, Lore, Hernan, and Maxi for organizing the side events and all of the side events that are coming. There are more side events coming. So please make sure to get all the information. Rob Habermeyer will be speaking. Sean Tabrisi will be speaking, who is around somewhere. Uh, the Inc. over there. The Inc. team will also be speaking. So please make sure to, to attend. They're very interesting talks. As Lore say, said, I'm a, I'm a Polkadot console member. Uh, I'm still a Kusama console member, although the console doesn't uh, really Pretty action much. anymore. <laughs> uh, and my job is to help teams use. Oops. My job is to help teams um, or advise team on how to propose uh, submissions to Treasury on governance on both Kusama and Polkadot. Uh, I don't want if you want to introduce yourself. I don't think you need introduction, but if you want to introduce yourself. Um, my name is uh, Gavin Wood. I have been, uh, I'm also a, a Kusama and Polkadot council member. Um, although I pay attention to it less than I ought. Uh, and I've been uh, working on this stuff for, uh, what are we, 2023? 20, so um, coming up to 10 years. Yeah, cool. So, I mean, initially I was going to do this talk alone, but then when Gab was here, we asked him if he wanted to join, and then he said yes. So the way we have organized this is, um, I'm going to talk a bit about Treasury and what Treasury means for both the Kusama and the Polkadot communities. And uh, we're then going to talk about governance a bit, because there is an intrinsic relationship between the Treasury and governance. We couldn't spend the Treasury funds. Community members could not uh, submit proposals in the Treasury if it was not because of the governance model that exists on both Kusama and Polkadot. And these are interesting times because Kusama and Polkadot right now have different governance models, right? Kusama is up and running on open governance, which is the next generation of governance, or governance two, as we call it. And Polkadot is still working on governance one, hopefully soon, uh, to be changed to, to open gov as well, in the same way as, as Kusama. So that's the reason why we're going to talk about treasury, but we're also going to talk a bit about governance, what the differences are between governance uh, one and governance two. And then uh, we're going to talk about what we want to see in Treasury this year, maybe next year, what new categories could be out there for Treasury, because Treasury categories keep evolving over time as well as the networks evolve. And so then we're going to make, yeah, we're going we're to have some questions, hopefully, from, the, from you guys, if, if you feel like it. And then we're going to have some drinks, maybe some Montfernet, right? So, um, Polkadot, it's very interesting because it provides the structure for users to form collectives. And the governance models on both Kusama and, and Polkadot are based on this notion of collectives, right? Collectives having privileges and collectives uh, being able to, to, to execute calls on chain that allows us, for example, to change uh, parameters in the network, but also to update the networks with new releases on runtime upgrades, and also to spend the treasury, right? And the main, the fundamental element that moves all of these collectives is that the stakeholders of the networks, the token holders of the networks, are the ones who, who have the ultimate decision into how the network should change, what should we spend the treasury on, and so on. And it's a bit different when it comes to governance one and governance two. We have different type of collectives on governance one, on Polkadot right now, and we have other collectives on Kusama with OpenGov, which makes it more direct and more democratic and so on. We're going to talk about it later. So when we think about governance, we need to think about the treasury as well. And the reason why we think about the treasury when we think about governance is because the governance models allows us to spend the treasury, right? The treasury is, it can be, because it, can, it can technically be defined as a pallet in the runtime upgrade, but for those 
non-technical people, not the people in the academy, but those who are here um, and want to learn more about the treasury. The treasury is basically a pot of funds, right? It's, it's, a, it's an address that exists on, on chain, and it has a pot of funds, and it gets funded via a transaction fees, staking inefficiencies, and so on. So we always say that the funds that are in the treasury are community funds. They belong to the community because the users are the one that generate the funds, so to say, in order to fund this uh, particular treasury. And so the community needs to be the one that decides how to spend this treasury, okay? So we see the treasury as a decentralized community-driven funding mechanism for Polkadot and Kusama projects. And originally the treasury, um, I remember back in 2020, when Kusama just started, the treasury was a way to, to start funding public infrastructure, right? This, um, these uh, projects that it, they're really difficult to monetize, right? These open source projects that are essential for the network to exist, but are very difficult to get funding for. And we're talking about open source wallet integration and development. We're talking about indexers. We're talking about explorers. And a lot of the projects that exist right now on Polkadot and Kusama got funded initially and still get funded via maintenance proposals through the treasury. So the treasury is a very important tool for the community that the community controls itself. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic way to, to, to get the community involved and to get the community participate on, on, on governance as well. As I said, initially, these particular uh, treasuries were, were focused on infrastructure. It was a focus on infrastructure deployment and continued operations. But the beauty of Substrate is also that this change, Substrate allows this change to evolve over time and to satisfy the needs of the token holders and to satisfy the needs of the community. And via runtime upgrades, you can develop more and evolve these networks and change the networks and delete things that don't work or change the things that do. And, and so the categories and the funded activities also evolve with time, right? We don't, we now, right now, we don't only um, fund public infrastructure, but we also fund cross-chain applications development. Um, we also fund network security operations. We, find, we fund ecosystem provisions, marketing activities, education activities, events. This event right now is funded by the events bounty from the Polkadot Treasury. Um, we, find, we fund education, we fund, uh, we fund research, academic and non-academic research. So these categories evolve over time. And it doesn't mean that these categories are static, right? New categories can appear, all categories can be deleted. And that's a very important part of how we should think about the treasury in order, for, for, in order to adapt to, to what the community wants and what the community needs. And Initially, we had only two spending mechanisms. We, we define spending mechanisms as the way that, let's say, the community members submit their ideas for, for, for the collective that is in charge of the management of the treasury to decide for yes or for no for a particular spending. On governance one, for example, the normal route was for these uh, submitters to go to the council. This group of people or organizations that sit on the council uh, and, and were elected by, by token holders as well. But with open governance, this has changed. And all of the treasury proposals go to the community to be voted by the community directly, right? And initially, what we had was two spending mechanisms, what we call spending proposals and what we call tips. And then, a, a community member from, from Kusama and, Polka, and Polkadot, uh, Emil from, from Polkascan, which was one of the first explorers that got funding from Web3 Foundation grants and later from the Treasury, um, came up with the idea of a new spending mechanism. And this spending mechanism is called the bounties that is now in the middle. So I want to talk a bit about these three spending mechanisms because these are the ways in which community members like you, the people in the academy, uh, people like uh, organizations like Polkadot Hub, uh, and other people can actually get funding for the ideas that they have if they think these ideas particularly bring value, right? 
The spending proposals are the most common ones, the ones we see the most. And you have to think about it as kind of like a grants program application, so to say, that the community manages. So it's sort of a grant application that is uh, on Kusama right now voted by the community and on Polkadot voted by the council and sometimes voted by the community, right? And when we started thinking with the community about uh, what's the process that we need in place in order to, to spend the treasury, right? We were thinking, okay, so let's, let's lay this out as a grants proposal in which the community member identifies a problem and identifies a solution for this problem, which will be the deliverable, and then lays out in a document, in a proposal document, the milestones to reach this particular solution. And that's the way right now the community and those who propose um, to the Treasury lay out their document proposal for the community to review, give feedback, ask questions, or make any particular comments about their idea. This is a general structure that a spending proposal has right now on Polkadot and Kusama. Of course, you need to add what your goals are, right? What the deliverables are, what the roadmap is. At the moment when we started thinking about this with the community, we had a lot of technical proposals, right? We have much more technical proposals. So we were thinking about the milestones, the roadmap, what's the budget, what, what type of developers do you need, and so on. However, this can definitely be translated to um, other type of proposals, marketing proposals, education proposals, community proposals. And this particular structure works for any type of proposal, per se. There is guidelines for this, for you to follow, and there is a template if you want to use it. It is not mandatory, per se, to have a document as we suggest. When I work with teams that want to present things, I advise on doing this because it is easier for the community to understand what they want to do. But it's definitely not a mandatory thing. You can submit a proposal on chain without all of this structure. You can do whatever you want. The networks are open for you to submit. But you have to take into account that if there's no contextual information on the proposal, if there's no budget, if there is no explanation of what the problem is that you want to solve, then it is very difficult for the community to vote yes on it, right? So you have to give as much information as you can. Of course, a budget, a granular budget, is very, very important. If you see the proposals that we have on the governance forums right now, that some of the council members are voting or the community is voting on Kusama, you will see that these proposals are very thought out. They have granular budgets. They explain how are they going to spend the funds from the Treasury. They say what are the deliverables. They set out dates for them to, to deliver this to the community, where can they find it, how can they access the deliverables, and so on. The tipping mechanism is a bit different, because the tipping mechanism allows us to reward community members for something awesome, right? It allows us to, to tip community members for things that, that really bring added value to the community. I remember when the guys from the Polkadot Hub started working on the first project, which was the website with translations and, and, um, and uh, subtitles on videos from Sub-Zero, the first decoded, and so on, we started tipping them, right? Anyone could submit a tip uh, back then and right now for something that they think adds value to the community. But in general, we use tips for things that are already done, for things that are completed, for things that we see that has added a value um, to the community. There are developers also contributing to, to the GitHub repos on Substrate, on Cumulus, and on, on Polkadot that are uh, getting rewarded with tips by the community and by council member for their contributions, for, the, for opening issues, and so on. But also, these are used for non-technical things. These are used for translations, these are used for events, and so on. Uh, in general, the value of these tips are smaller than where we see on spending proposals. Spending proposals have a roadmap of maybe three, four, six months, 12 months, one year, two years, right? While tips are, are a bit smaller and, and the, the, the work is much more tangible. It's already done. And the third spending mechanism is, is, is pretty interesting uh, because the third mechanism that is bounties was born 
as a way to solve the problem of the console not paying attention or not having the time to review all of the proposals that the community was submitting or not having the expertise, right? This, in general, console members, uh, at the beginning at least, were, were, were developers and were part of, of the core uh, teams in the Polkadot and Kusama ecosystem. And, uh, but they didn't know about marketing, right? They didn't know about education. They didn't know about how to organize uh, translations, right? And so it's hard for some console members to be experts on everything. And so Bounty's mechanism is a way to delegate the curation activity of proposals, of these pending proposals, to uh, experts on the topic of, the, of a proposal called curators. And technically speaking, a curator is an address. It's a Kusama or a Polkadot address, right? And it can be organized as a multisig, so it works as a mini console of experts in marketing, in education, or in events. But it can also be one person, right? And the way it works is the community votes on opening a bounty for a particular topic. Let's say the events bounty that exists right now on Polkadot. And we allocate a portion of the treasury that stays in the treasury, is not moved, to this particular bounty only. So this portion is locked and stays on the treasury and is earmarked to be used only by this particular bounty. And then there is a second step in which we elect who the curators will be. And so if the curators organize around a multisig, for example, let's say a multisig of seven people that are experts on events, then they submit their application to be curators of this bounty. And if the community approves, then this particular address that they manage gets the authorization to spend those, uh, to those tokens, those funds that are allocated for this particular bounty. And this is an interesting way of spending uh, the treasury as well, because it allows two things. It allows a more efficient allocation of the funds. It allows people to, to, to submit proposals much more often and not to rely on the console. At, back then, it was only the console, so you know, we didn't have a lot of time. But it also allows a very important thing that in my opinion, in Polkadot we see it a bit more, but in Kusama we have yet to see, which is to budget the treasury, right? Which is a very important thing in order to maintain an organized and an efficient allocation of funds. And if we see, for example, the structure in which we need to, to, to present these uh, this, uh, proposals, these submissions, right? In general, there are four steps. To, to allow people to, to spend the funds. And the first one is draft the proposal, as we, as we said. You can find all of this also um, online. You'll find the links after for you to, to review and ask any questions you have. The second one is publish the proposal on a governance forum. We have several governance forums. Subsquare is a really good one, I really like. Polk Assembly is a legacy one, the one that was from the beginning. So we can push this for discussion. This is all an off-chain um, process for now. And the reason why we added this publication of the proposal is because when you submit on chain, you need to bond a certain amount of tokens. And if the proposal is rejected, then these tokens will be slashed and go to treasury. It's an anti-spam mechanism. So a lot of teams got really scared about losing this particular amount of funds. So we were like, OK, why don't we add an extra step in which they can publish their proposal and get feedback from the community, kind of like to, to um, take the temperature of what the community thinks about their proposals, make the changes, include and incorporate the feedback of the community, and then submit it off-chain, which is actually the fourth step, right? After they incorporate the feedback from the community, then they minimize the chance of rejection, and then they submit on chain and get the community to vote. In the case of Polkadot, the console is still working, so the console is the one voting on how to spend the funds. However, there are certain conditions. If a proposal is more than $500,000 in tokens, then the community has requested the console they want to have the ultimate decision, right? And this is a gradual step towards a more direct and decentralized voting like it is in OpenGov. Um, in Kusama, 
the community votes absolutely on everything right now. They vote on all of the Treasury proposals. They vote on tips, on tips, they vote on opening a bounty, and they elect the curators that they think are the best in order to manage this portion of, bound, of funds that are in the bounty, right? So here I have an example of one of the governance forums, right? This is a subsquare, and you can, I mean, you cannot see it, but the link is, the link is down there, but well, I'll, I'll give you the link after. If you enter to this forum, this is one of them, as you can see, we are on Polkadot right now, on Polkadot Network, and on the left, you'll have a column with all of the type of proposals that you can get on Polkadot. You'll see that you have referenda, you have treasury proposals, you have bounty proposals, you have child bounties, you have tips, you have also motions, you can also check who the members of the console are on Polkadot. And here is exactly where proposal, the teams that want to propose are uh, submitting their application, they publish their application in order for the community to leave comments, to leave their feedback, to ask questions, right? And after this process is done, they can also use this particular governance forum and also Polk Assembly to submit directly from here their proposals to the Treasury so the community votes. So let's talk some numbers. At the moment, as you can see to the left, I have Kusama Network, and at the right, I have Polkadot. You can see this is a graph that shows more or less of the allocation in the different categories that we saw before for the Treasury. As you can see on Kusama, Kusama is the experimental network, right? So on Kusama, we have a lot of infrastructure uh, spending. We have a lot of um, software development spending, wallet integration and uh, development. We have some liquidity provision proposals over there and some bounties, marketing activities and whatnot. As you can see, and this is what I was saying before, on Polkadot, the community took more seriously the idea of using bounties to budget the treasury. So really, the allocation of bounties on Polkadot is huge. It's about 73, 72% of the network, of the total of the treasury that was spent. There we have the events bounty. We have the Pioneer's Prize bounty. We have different bounties that have millions of dots allocated only to spend on this particular activity. So the community goes directly to these curators to request for, for funding. They don't go to console anymore. They don't go to the community. But what's interesting is that if the community thinks that these curators are misbehaving or these curators are not doing a good job, they still have the power to take them out of the role and to elect a new one, right? A new set of curators. So far on Kusama, we have had more than 240 proposals, 816 tips, and 20 bounties. On Polkadot, it's a younger network, and always we experiment first on Kusama. We have 208 approved proposals, 546 tips, and 20 bounties up and running right now. But as I said, the governance is intrinsically related to what Treasury is, right? So I want to talk a bit about, well, I want Gavin to talk. I'm not going to bore you anymore with, with my speech. I, want, I will let Gavin talk now. Um, I want to talk about a bit how Polkadot and Kusama evolves and how Substrate allows for Polkadot and its parachains to evolve over time via runtime upgrades and how governance has also changed via runtime upgrades and what are the difference that we see on uh, governance one and governance two. But first, I want to ask you a question of like, I mean, you've talked about this before, but why on-chain governance, right? What do you think on-chain governance? I've seen you many times talking about this, and the three main reasons for me in particular is that forks are not only bad for code, but it's it's also bad for the communities. Forks hurt the community a lot. So the ultimate idea of governance is on-chain consensus, an unstoppable way of deciding something and making all of the stakeholders accountable for the decision. Uh, and why, and, and the idea behind on-chain governance is also that in our, in our uh, opinion, Often governance, it's a bit sketchy, 
right? It allows small groups to make decisions on behalf of really big groups. It allows uh, often collectives to organize over phone calls or conferences and either leads to like very shadow hierarchies or leads to decisions that are not really taking into account what the community wants, right? So all of these problems have led to, to some people like Web3 Foundation, Parity, and the community in Polkadot and Kusama to implement this on-chain collectives and governance. So I want to hear your opinion on on-chain governance and why do you think it's important? Um, yeah. So if we, if we boil it down, we have to understand what is governance. Um, Governance is essentially the rules that determine not what a system does internally, but how a system evolves over time. So we think of these systems as essentially um, rules-based playgrounds, like Polkadot is a rules-based playground, um, as are essentially all well-functioning um, digital systems. Now, if you already know what the rules in your rules-based playground should be forever, at the point where you're launching it, then you don't have a problem and you don't really need governance. But as soon as you want those rules to change over time in some way that you cannot predict from the very beginning, um, then you need some way of determining how they should be changed um, at, at some later stage. You can think about this in terms of nation states, right? Um, when, when, you know, America was, was sort of founded and they have the, the, you know, they introduced the constitution. It's like, they did not expect that this was all of the law that they would ever need for, <laughs> for time immemorial. No. Um, of course, they baked into the Constitution the possibility of the Constitution itself being amended. And they specified what the rules were for this and included the possibility of even these rules specifying how the rules could be amended, could be amended. Yeah? So governance is about altering the overall rules of the system, including possibly the rules which govern how those rules can be altered. If your governance... Let's think, what does a blockchain provide? A blockchain provides a means by which rules can be followed um, in a, uh, a well-enforced, strictly enforced manner over time. Like, how are they enforced? Well, we, we use cryptography, we use game theory, economics, decentralization, in order to ensure that rules are correctly um, executed upon. So does it not seem reasonable that if we have rules to govern how a system should evolve over time, and it turns out that our system is capable of perfectly executing rules, that we should use our system to determine how it should evolve over time? What is the alternative? Well, the alternative is to uh, not use this, you know, apparently good rules-based um, execution environment to determine how um, it should evolve over time, but instead use the wider world of people who will just kind of figure it out and maybe come to some sort of agreement and kind of get their heads, like, it, none, of, none of this makes any sense. Like, if you ask people who are against um, properly enforced rules for how the, um, the rule-based environment should change over time, the, um, the answer is very vague. And it, it's to do with, like, vague, con vague consensus. Rough, con sorry, rough consensus. Mm, yeah, misspoke there. Um, it, it, it doesn't really make that much sense. It's like you're kind of trying to define some rules, but you're unwilling to have these rules actually be properly um, uh, enforced. It's like, 
well, do you want the rules or not? Like, if you don't want the rules, then just admit it's a dictatorship, <laughs> yeah? But if there are rules, then make the rules actually enforceable by not you. <laughs> um, unfortunately, uh, you know, this argument does seem lost um, oftentimes, and I, I, guess, uh, I guess there are sort of social reasons why. But for me, it seems that if we want this system, Polkadot, Kusama, whatever else, um, to uh, actually have rules over how it should change over time, like, you know, voting rules, like uh, some degree of democracy, uh, you know, um, quadratic voting or uh, whatever, but you know, whatever the rules, you know, we want, <laughs> um, if we want actually those rules to be enforced, then we should obviously give it to this um, rule enforcer um, that we spent so much time engineering to actually work, uh, we should give it the rules to, be, um, to, to enforce. No? Let's talk about the rules, right? Because, I mean, here you have... It's a very complex graph. It was complex for me when I first saw it. This is the governance one model, right? And uh, you need to focus on this three particular upper part, the, 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 the upper part, right? We have the dot holders, which was what we call on Governance One, the democracy module. You had the council and you had the technical committee, right? And Governance One has worked really well for the first two years on Polkadot and Kusama because it allowed us to, to act fast on emergency runtime, to, to fix issues but also to see how we could adapt with the community over time in order to vote and discuss and propose and what would be the best ways to do so. But eventually it became obsolete, right? And it's very interesting to think of this particular idea of first-class citizens and second-class citizens in Governance One model. However, something that not a lot of people are aware of is that, in my opinion at least, Council members could be considered first-class citizens, but there were very limited things that council members could do or can do on Polkadot, because most of it needs the decision of the community to approve for it, right? We need dot holders to vote on democracy module with root origin for majority of the things in order to enact most of things. The council alone cannot upgrade the runtime of the network, right? The council cannot change a lot of the staking parameters of the network, right? And these are important things. The relay chain focus on interoperability, interoperability and shared security. And these things cannot be changed by the console alone. But when you think about governance one model, and here my, my uh, really uh, good, nice graphic design skills, I put like three crosses on what open governance model the leads, which is basically the council, the technical committee, and the part of public proposals, everything going to public referenda. What changed with open governance? Why? And what do you think this was the, the way forward? Um, open, open governance was really, um, as the name might suggest, an effort to um, uh, bring forward uh, decentralization of the network. Um, when we think of decentralization, I suspect one of the, the biggest things we think of is in terms of the validators, uh, possibly the economics. Um, but perhaps, you know, a sort of less recognized element of decentralization is um, the governance. And while the council, uh, you're absolutely right, and the council could not um, do things like upgrade the network at will, it nonetheless did exist as a, an important element within the overall governance framework, um, and it did have certain powers, um, as did the technical committee. Um, We are in a period of global uh, regulatory uncertainty over 
these decentralized systems. Um, and we need to do more to ensure, even at a practical level, ignoring the political environment, um, that the systems are actually decentralized, which is to say we need to do more to ensure that more people are involved in the decision-making process. Um, the council and the technical committee was clearly a, uh, an exclusive set of individuals, um, perhaps, you know, voted in or otherwise meritocratically um, appointed, but still an exclusive set of individuals. And so it makes sense, if we are to decentralize the network, to attempt to um, remove these um, uh, as much as possible, um, where, uh, where possible, um, if needed, replace them with much larger groups, and ideally with the largest group of all, which is the token holders. Um, the, uh, one of the biggest reasons that we have the council is to ensure that um, when there needs to be, when multiple things need to happen on the network at once, um, the council acts as a kind of gateway to ensure that only the sort of benevolent things pass, uh, not pass, um, pass this gateway to become voted on. One of the things that um, Gov2 does, uh, OpenGov um, does, is it removes that necessity. It allows for the possibility of many things all to be voted on at the same time. Um, and it manages this by introducing the possibility of there being different privilege levels, where lower privilege levels can do accordingly less things, less damage, let's, let, let, let's say, um, uh, but can all be voted up, but, but many of which can be voted on at the same time, whereas the very higher, higher, well, the highest privilege level, only one thing, much like Ingov1, can be voted on at the same time. Um, this helps get lots more activity through governance. It helps have many more individuals involved in that activity. Um, without, uh, and yet, it, it, it doesn't compromise, or it's at least designed, not to compromise the overall security of the network. On Governance 1, we also had delegation, right? But it was a very rudimentary way to delegate your tokens compared to what we have right now on, open, on OpenGov. What has changed regarding that? Because we cannot expect 100% of the token holders to be active on a daily basis. I mean, I, wake, I, work on, I work on governance. I wake up every morning and I have three new proposals on Kusama that I didn't have the night before, right? So it's a very demanding thing to have every day reviewing proposals, voting on them, and not everyone can do it. But we have this beautiful thing that is called delegation as well. So what changes governance one delegation? What changes with, with OpenGov on, when it comes to delegation palette that we didn't have on governance one? Um, I think one of the biggest, uh, and for me, the most interesting things that we introduced with Gov2, with OpenGov, is, uh, is indeed in delegation. So I mentioned before that there are uh, uh, these different privilege levels. Well, the different privilege levels correspond to different tracks. The idea that a track is where you can have um, one or many different votes going on at the same time for the same privilege level. Um, and these privilege levels basically are like kind of, um, uh, they're like reasons that you actually want to use governance. Um, a privilege level might be in order to make a particularly a large spend from the treasury. Another one might, might be to make a tip, a very small spend from the treasury. Another one might be to upgrade the runtime. Another one might be to unbrick a parachain. Um, and there are very, very many, like there are, I think, tw 12, 20, I don't know. Tracks? Yeah. 16. 16. I think, yeah. 
So we've got like 16 tracks, right? 16 different reasons that you might want to use governance. And if you think of it, it's almost like uh, to take uh, the analogy of like a, a, a sort of je a, a national government, it's kind of like 16 different areas of, of, of the law um, that the government might want to change, right? That, that particular um, uh, proposals, motions um, might, might alter. Um, and as such, it's not unreasonable to expect that different individuals would be better suited to judge different tracks, right? Different are areas of the law, right? Different areas of, 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 of this chain, this system. So with delegation in Gov2, in OpenGov, you are now able to delegate different tracks to different delegates. You may not want to delegate some tracks at all. You may reserve them for yourself because they may be very, very, um, it may be very rare for these tracks to have anything on them. And you may not necessarily want to um, trust your delegate with that. Um, I might delegate to one person to judge um, motions concerning tips, which are relatively minor. I might delegate to another person for motions concerning grants someone else for motions concerning technical elements, um, so, and, some, and maybe I leave it to myself for uh, motions concerning runtime upgrades or, you know, uh, uh, rescues where, uh, you know, uh, money is, is minted, you know, this, this kind of level of, of, of privilege, the ultra, ultimate level, of root level of privilege. Um, and so this allows a much more agile level of voting. And I think it's actually something that perhaps um, other democratic systems could, uh, uh, could take some, um, uh, some ideas from. And what I think is also interesting is that this tracks, the same as the categories that we had on treasury funding, this tracks can evolve over time. We can add new tracks, right? We, we test on Kusama the ones we have. In my opinion, I've already identified two more curves we could have, two more tracks we could have. One, because the thing is, if you don't have a particular track for a particular call, this, this call will go by default to root, which is very hard to pass, it's dangerous. We need to have it empty in case we have an emergency, you know? For example, for me, the idea of um, having a track for bounties, to budget the treasury it would be nice, I think, the same way we have for small, uh, small uh, treasury proposals, medium, big treasury proposals, something only for bounties, not only to allocate the funding, but also to elect the, the bounty curators, and something to, to assist on uh, umbric parachains that have difficulties and, and need help from the relating governance in order to fix an issue, right? Those are the two things that I think could be a good thing to experiment with on Kusama, see how it works, uh, and we can add them via runtime upgrades. So that's also a beautiful thing to have, right? And if we talk about treasury, um, if we go back a bit to treasury, we talked about these categories, and um, we have had very different proposals towards for the years, right? We have, I don't know, we had client implementations, wallet integration, wallet development, mobile applications, cross-chain applications, marketing events, the decoded, Sub-Zero, the Davos conference. We had a lot of different ones. And of course, the Kusama and the Polkadot community are slightly different, right? The Kusama community is a bit more, um, I don't want to say innovative, but they dare to try things that maybe Polkadot is a bit more conservative about. They don't do it, right? They don't want to do it. What do you want to see or what do you think uh, Polkadot and Kusama needs? Or what do you think the treasury needs to fund in this new stage of development? What, would you, what kind of projects would you like to see on treasury? Um, I, I think we need to... Um uh, 
Well, the things I would most like to see are, are some very interesting um, takes on decentralization. I would like to see uh, I, good ideas of how to um, raise awareness, educate, and advocate. Um, I suppose I'd like to see just new ideas being presented. Like, hey, here's maybe the, the, the amounts of funds are quite small for these new ideas. Maybe the, 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 the proposal isn't like quite as deep as, as you know, some of the bigger ones are. Um, but I would like to see um, you know, proposals in the range of, say, 100 to $1,000 um, that maybe a single person or two people could do in a, in, you know, in a few days. Um, that just um, that, that, that raise awareness in a you know, small but reasonable way. Um, ideally, ideas that can be replicated everywhere. Over time. I, think, I don't think we've had too many of these kind of proposals. They tend to be either tips, where someone's done a little bit of like, you know, digital whatever, or they tend to be, you know, big $10,000 plus, you know, projects. That was one of the issues with Governance One, right? Because the process to apply for funding on Governance One was long. A lot of community members complained the process is long, the process is slow, council members don't pay attention, they take too much time to, to give to review and give feedback, and for some people, it's not worth it, right? When, when they ask for 100 or for 1,000, and so that's the tip solution, right? It gave us, like, tips was a bit more dynamic. It gave us more flexibility and freedom to do so. With open governance, it's easier to do so. Anyone can submit any type of proposal, any type of amount, and the community votes right away. And if it has enough, uh, if it fulfills the conditions, or the thresholds of support and approval, then they get the funding, right? In Kusama, maximum 14 days. On Polkadot at the moment, a motion lasts for six days. But if the community needs to, to vote on a proposal on Polkadot, it can take up to 28 days, right? At a normal lunch period. And that's also why Polkadot is a bit more conservative. It is slower than Kusama. And so all of this type of experimentations I'd like to see on Kusama as well. There's been a topic this year that has come up over and over again. Well, two topics. Uh, the first one is, should teams that, particip that, should teams that got funding from the Treasury be allowed to vote with those funds on governance proposals, right? I personally think that as long as they deliver what they promise to the community, in the way that they promise to the community, they should be able to do whatever they want with those tokens. It's their tokens, the community has given those to them, and as long as they deliver what they promise, then you know, they can do whatever they want. It's part of, they're, they're community members, it's, they're part of the community. And the second topic is, should parachains get funding from the treasury? And this is a very recurring topic that has come all over in 2022, and we'll probably see the discussions in 2023. And my personal opinion is that I think they should. I think, parach I think the treasury should open to, to parachains. It's already open for common good chains, but these are different type of, of chains in the system. These are system parachains. They either replace functionality from the relay chain, or they add functionality that doesn't exist, but the relay chain needs, so to say, right? So they're considered an extension of the relay chain. What is your opinion on, on parachains getting funding from the Treasury? Do you think, my opinion is they should, there should be an objective criteria decided by the community. I don't think, for example, I don't know if there's a way to control this, but I don't think they should use this funding to, to um, renew or to, to, to acquire a new slot, for example, right? I don't know how we would be able to solve this particular type of control. I don't know if we can do that. But what's your opinion on, on an objective criteria and standards for parachains to start applying for funding from Treasury? Um, I don't think parachains are any different from any other. I don't think parachains are any different from any other organization. 
um, for the purposes of determining whether uh, how they are allowed to use their treasury given tokens and whether they are allowed to interact with the treasury. Um, which is to say, I think it, they can use their tokens for whatever they want. Like it, it's their tokens. Like you know, if they have the dot tokens, I would be um, saddened if they are not using them for something on yeah. on Polkadot, right? Um, and of course, if they if they believe that they can do something which is um, you know beneficial for the Polkadot network. Um, something which would typically be covered by the treasury, then of course they should apply to do it. Um, they should definitely, like, it would be um, foolish to, to, to ban um, a parachain team from using a Polkadot resource simply because what well, they plan to help make Polkadot more useful, this, they plan to use Polkadot, like, this is, this, this is, you know, seems to me to be obviously foolish. Can you, hear, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, to finish, uh, I want to leave you two QR codes here that you will be able to scan after if you want. The first one is the Polkadot Treasury website. On the left, you have this. On the Polkadot Treasury website, you will be able to find the steps that we talk about, the mechanisms that we talked about, the guidelines and the template. If you have a good idea, if you, if you have an idea that you think will bring value to the community for the Polkadot um, Academy students, but also for anyone else in the community that is here or that is listening to us and they think they can contribute to make Polkadot better, then make sure to, to check the guidelines and the, and the, and the um, rules by the community on the use of treasury. Apply. You can find us always in the direction channels or you can find us on bulk assembly, on the governance forums, on Subsquare. Ask the questions that you want to ask. We're here to help you um, apply to Treasury. We're here to, to help you uh, engage in that and, and, and talk to the community about what, they, what the community thinks they need and how you can help. And to the right, we have a QR code for you to learn more about governance. This QR code takes you to the wiki, to the Polkadot and Kusama wiki. And this is a really great resource of documentation for people that want to learn more about governance, governance one, and open governance as well. You'll find all of the information there as well, not only on governance, but also on staking, on how the network works, on the difference between relay chain and parachains. chains. It's very accessible. For those of you, para los que hablan en español, los chicos del Polkadot Hub eh, traducen el, 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 el wiki de Polkadot y Kusama, pueden utilizarlo. También ahí, Lore y Hernán y Maxi puede, pueden darles eh, la dirección web para que vean en la wiki de Polkadot ahí también. So, other than that, I think if you guys have questions um, for Gav, not for me, please, but for, for Gav, if you have any questions, then we open... Uh, the stage for, for a few questions, and then uh, we can all have more fun, if you want. Muchísimas gracias. ¿Alguna pregunta? De polka. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Hi, Gavin. Uh, was uh, a wonderful exposition. Thank you. I'm Ariel here from Argentina, Buenos Aires. Well, uh, regarding the, the things you said, uh, was great. I, I don't have any questions. I will be looking forward of the QRs and the articles and, uh, and see all the information. I want maybe to take advantage of this opportunity to ask you about your expectations and projections maybe for the gaming field and how Polkadot can work with a gaming. Uh, we, uh, we are a game studio and we are looking for uh, good opportunities to work together. So uh, maybe just that. 
uh, what do you think about the game file field and the play to earn uh, games uh, in general? I don't want to promote my game, don't worry. Uh, okay. Um, I think it's, it, it, it's, you know, possibly one of the few legitimate uses of NFTs. Um, I think it, it, it. I think we can see, um, uh, you know, Polkadot blockchain um, being a possible substrate um, for uh, games uh, to to connect to games. Um, so you know. You know, you, you can maybe make some sort of, uh, uh, you know, there are a few ways of doing this that I can imagine. One of them is to have like a, a, some sort of currency that multiple games use and that is, you know, valuable in, in, in all games and that you can move between games with. Um, but maybe like, uh, you know, thinking more, more broadly about how different games could possibly use um, the same... Um, game, I don't know, concepts, objects, whatever, and that again they could be uh, moved between games, uh, moved between environments. I mean, I guess this is some basically the basis of metaverse stuff. Um, but it seems to me that you know, if you can somehow uh, create a critical mass of environments that utilize a digital object, a digital asset. Um, then that digital asset could could possibly be sensibly utilized outside of these well aligned um, games into into you know maybe other games producers might say well your digital asset library is so rich and well supported amongst your own games i'm just going to start supporting them in my games in order that, to sort of bring on some of your users into my environment and once you can like jump once you can get to that critical mass um then you know we, we start sort of imagining um, as a, 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 a game object library that you know you can take with you into many into games you know produced by many different um, uh, uh, teams and publishers, um, and I think this is like a, a pretty uh, pretty interesting possibility. Um, yeah, I mean, and then of course there's you know taking it a bit sort of in the other direction, um, games that exist sort of more on-chain, right? So games where it, it, it's not some server somewhere that's like, you know, uh, with some proprietary code and, and that the players connect to, but actually, I don't know, it's like a card game or something, maybe like a collectible card game, right? But where you play on-chain. And with, with, you know, Polkadot's sort of level of um, scalability, we can actually start to imagine the possibility of having um, you know, a large, uh, a mass market collectible card game, say, that exists, that, where, that is played on chain, and therefore whose rules are guaranteed to be enforced, and therefore the rules can um, have some degree of economics behind them. You know, I remember in the early days, I used to play Magic the Gathering in, in the early days, uh, in, the, in, the, in the mid-90s, um, and, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that you would usually play when you were playing um, would be to have an ante card, right? So you basically draw a card at random from the decks before you play, and then whoever the winner is gets both cards, yeah? Um, so there was a, a very clear economic incentive to winning. Uh, and if you had a good deck, then the chances were that the card that, that was going to be drawn that you'd potentially lose was actually valuable, like it was worth money, like potentially quite a lot of money. So you, you better well be a good player and know how to use your good cards or you're going to end up like hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging money here after you keep playing these games. And I think, I think like doing something maybe similar like through on-chain mechanisms um, could be quite an interesting sort of innovation in this regard. Um, and of course, if you combine that with uh, programmable or programmability, then you could imagine like um, where you end up with uh, you know, user-created uh, cards with their rules that interact with the environmental rules with other cards, um, but that were not conceived when the game was conceived. 
you know, again, to take the uh, magic, the gathering analogy, like, over time, more rules have been introduced to the game, right? More cards have been introduced, the cards have their own rules, even more environmental concepts have been introduced that cards can then utilize. Um, well, you know, this is all coming from just one gaming company. What happens if you open it up so that everyone can create cards with whatever rules they want? Everyone can introduce new environmental concepts that cards can draw upon. Of course, you know, you're going to end up with cards that are just like, play this card, win the game. But then, you will, then, then this brings forth the possibility of having curators that like, look out for interest cards with interesting rules and curate collections. Yeah? And then you can have, like, I don't know, compet competition collections for these things. So I think, you know, when you think about the possibility of like, um, mass access and programmability, then like games can become, you know, you've got an awful lot of, of uh, new avenues that you can go down as a game designer. Anyone else? Yeah, hey Gavin. Um, so, with the introduction of Open Gov and Kusama, there's been some community sentiment that Kusama has sort of turned into an oligarchy because there's a couple of validators that run a lot of nodes and have an enormous amount of tokens. Um, do you think that is a problem? And do you have any solutions for it? And do you think delegating to community groups can be part of that solution? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, did you get any of that? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry. There's been some community sentiment that with the introduction of OpenGov, Kusama has become sort of an oligarchy um, because there's a couple of validators that have so many tokens from running a lot of nodes, and they basically control all the votes. Do you think that's a problem? Do you have any solutions for it? Um, and do you think delegating to community groups can combat that? Uh, talking about, you're talking about factions in the voting system? Yeah, basically the, the validators because they have so many tokens. Okay. Yeah, so what do you think about the friction? If I under, yeah, young beef, right? Yeah. So um, correct me if I'm wrong. What do you think about the friction when it comes to the voting model, the governance model, between different small groups lobbying and factioning towards a vote for yes or no, for example, validators, that's what you said? Hello, yep, okay. I think, um, I don't see any obvious issue uh, arising yet. Um, I, I suppose I would accept that, uh, not validators, but stakers, are more likely to vote um, simply because their tokens are already in the system and locked. Um, so they will be well represented. If stakers are represented, does it mean um, who, who is n less possibly represented? I guess those that um, want to keep their tokens liquid. That's sort of by design. Conviction, yeah. the point of conviction voting is to ensure that those who are locked into a, to the system have a greater voice than those who might exit at any time. Um, so at least at the moment, uh, I, I don't see a, a big issue. Um, I think the issue could be bigger uh, for other chains with different forms of consensus. Um, for example, in a proof-of-work chain, where it's quite likely that uh, the validators have no tokens whatsoever, could have an, uh, you know, a, a, an outsized effect, a voice in, in governance. I see this as a much bigger issue. Whereas validators, like those who literally just run validator nodes, who have no funds at stake, they, don't, they, they still don't have any voice yeah, in Kusama or Polkadot. Um, those that have voice are stakers. Now, some validators are stakers as well, um, but a lot of stakers are nominators uh, who, who are not the ones running the, net, running the network. They're just the ones who are you know, backing those who run the network, selecting them. Um, 
And if, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't see a, a great issue so far with those guys who, you know, have their funds locked and polka dot for at least one month, um, with, you know, uh, having them be active members of the, of the voting community. That said, um, I think we should always be looking out for ways of improving um, the decentralization um, and the, uh, uh, I guess, the, 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 uh, the variety of voices um, uh, within the decision-making system in order to maximize the possibility um, that our system uh, you know, is actually optimal. At the moment, we have relatively few tools to do that. And I would hope with, uh, you know, particularly some of the, the, the newer things that are being uh, released, the fellowship being the first one, but, you know, there's also plans for an ambassador fellowship, plans for a ecosystem technical fellowship. Um, and eventually, I would hope, uh, uh, plans for recognizing everybody that is just physically an active community, member, like people that turn up to meetups, yeah? Um, and when we, when we can recognize more and more individuals, um, then we have, I think, a greater chance of crafting uh, a governance system that, is, uh, that can withstand a greater level of bias, prejudice, attack. On the, on the, on the role of validators in the voting system, I want I to I mention, because I think it's great work, for those of you who don't know, there is a program on Polkadot and Kusama that is called the 1000 Validator Program, right? And the 1000 Validators Program um, allows uh, small validators to enter the active set of validators on Kusama and Polkadot. Uh, it's a program that is run by Web3 Foundation and uh, Will, who is the, the program manager, he is the master of validators. He is the guy um, working with his team on the scoring and how to calculate um, which validators, which small validators should enter to the active set. And everything can, is public and can be seen through a public dashboard. And voting on governance is one of the elements that increases the score of this operators in order to enter the active set of validators. And since this particular rule or condition was included, on Kusama and on Polkadot, there has been a significant increase in participation when it comes to, to proposals up for vote. So, yeah, just want to note that as well. Thanks, guys. Anyone, Anyone else? I no? Mario? Mario? Yeah, good night. In general speaking, which will be your expectations for Latin America this year? Year one? Ah, no, pardon, no escucho nada. <laughs> yes, uh, sounds the, pretty bad. The, your expectation for Latin America this year? I, I assume in the blockchain world, right? Not in general. Developing... <laughs> uh, what, would you, what, would be, what would be your expectations yeah. when it comes to blockchain yeah. for Latin America? This year. For Latin. Yeah. Okay. For Latin. This week? This year. This, this year. This year. <laughs> uh, I, I hope that we can. Um, I hope that we can really increase the ambassador uh, program here. Um, and I hope we can. Uh, I, I see it as, as being a, a really important. Um, source of um, these energy for decentralization. Yeah. And it's sort of my personal mission to decentralize Polkadot for, you know, it's, it, <laughs> I've been working on it for like last year. I'm like, I got a couple of things taking my attention right now, like this, these last few weeks, but this year I'm also going to be very heavily focused on, um, I don't know, I guess like bringing. Uh, 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 decentralizing the um, individuals, like the, 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 the group of humans um, that constitute the network, the community, those who may help maintain it, um, all the way from you know, core developers down to just 
you know, people that are interested and want to rock up to meetups. Um, so I, I really hope, I, you know, I see a lot of, a lot of desire for that um, in this part of the world, more so uh, than, than in Europe, I would say, more so even than in North America. Um, so uh, yeah, I hope, uh, and you know, I see a lot of, a lot of uh, talent as well, a lot of potential. So I hope we can, um, I hope we can really sort of see that here and show like the rest of the world how it can be done. Cool. Okay, and with that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for my, so much for select Latin America to, to this event. Um, all of you, we will have a second side event on thir January 31 and the third on February 8th. So uh, we will see you again. And uh, no. Can, you can take some something to drink, something to yeah, eat. We have a cocktail in the uh, North Main stage, in the other place. Uh, before you go, uh, follow us a uh, memory of tonight, please, with Raul. What do we do? Gab. Gab. Así? Cheers, guys. Thank you. Gracias, Negro. Ahora.